So how many of you watched the opening ceremonies Friday night of the Olympics? Yeah, I have to say I love it. Um, I love watching that first night. I had my grandkids there, and I'd really built up and told them all about it. And, of course, then, you know, for them it's a little bit boring, right? And, you know, I said, oh, we're going to get to see all the countries walk in, and they're going to have their flags. And about at Canada, they're like, yeah, okay, you know. But, you know, the torch being brought in is really exciting, and, and the fireworks, there's just something exciting about the Olympic Games. But did you know that as far back, as 14, the 1400s B.C., religious festivals honoring the gods were held uh, with athletic contests, and they were held in Greece. Now, to give you a sense of perspective, that's the time of Joshua and the judges. Okay, that's a long time ago. The first known Olympic contest was held in 776 B.C., and it took place in a stadium that held 40,000 people in Olympia, Greece. That's why it became known as the Olympics. And there was only one race run. It was a sprint of less than 200 meters. So 40,000 people came out to watch this one race. <laughs> well, soon the other events were added, and they had chariot races and wrestling. But 1,000 years later, in 394 A.D., okay, so... 394 after Jesus, uh, the Roman emperor Theodosius uh, ordered it into the Olympics because he thought they were too pagan. And so the games weren't played for another 1,500 years. There were a lot of attempts to revive the Olympic Games, but it wasn't until the 19th century when a team of German archaeologists were excavating the site of the original Olympiad, um, and this idea was reborn. And a French educator, hearing about that excavation, had an idea. And he, he said, why can't the Olympic Games be revived as a way of promoting world peace? That idea captured the imagination. And in 1896, the first modern Olympic Games began. And they were held in Athens, Greece. Now, for the first time since 1908... The Olympic Games are held in Rio amid lots of controversy. Controversy about the Zika virus, about the risk of sickness and disease from the um, Rio 3 outdoor water venues, political turmoil in Brazil, and of course, as always, the doping crisis among athletes. So there's lots of attention that has been focused on things other than the actual games. But even though all that's going on, there's still something exciting about watching more than 10,000 athletes representing 205 countries, including two independent teams, one team of refugees and one team of an independent team, competing in 306 sporting events. More than 3.6 million people are expected to watch the programming that's going to have over 6,000 hours that you can watch over the next, what is it, 10 days. And you know, while we're watching these Olympics, I don't know about you, but we love to cheer them on. And somehow cheering seems to make a difference. Let's watch this. When you wish. Third attempt at a new world record. They fly just a little bit higher. Bob is funny to be when you scream, they go just a little bit further. When you hold your breath, well, they can even be perfect. And when we come together to cheer as one, We know what happens. I get goosebumps seeing that. I don't know about you. The crowds cheering and hoping and praying, even if they're there in the stadium or at home, somehow seems to make a difference, doesn't it? Somehow. When I was in high school, I was captain of the drill team in my senior year. We had this really special halftime show that we thought was cool. We walked out on the field in our uniforms, at one point in the, the performance, we turned around, and on the back 
we had a doll on the back of us that nobody knew. You know, the face was on the back of our hats. And uh, the crowd went wild. And when everybody was cheering, we probably did the best performance we had ever done. There was something about this crowd cheering us on that gave us encouragement, made us try harder. We did a better job. Well, today, the Owens read us a scripture that reminds us that we all have folks cheering us on every single day in our journey of faith. As the writer of Hebrews says, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, the writer's drawing on a sporting, sporting image that was very familiar to the people in New Testament times, a picture of a very enthusiastic crowd, even bigger than that 40,000 that were at that first uh, original Olympic stadium. You need to realize that these readers had either gone to or participated or heard about the Olympic Games. They were going on during this time. And throughout the scriptures, we find lots of places where the spiritual life is compared to a race. But here, the image of the race is not focused on winning, but on how to go the distance, how to fully engage in the life of faith. You see, the original readers of this were being persecuted. Most were likely Jewish people who had become Christian. And now they were starting to wonder if that had been a very good decision. Should they remain Jewish? Being Jew in the Roman Empire was not the best experience, but it was a lot better to be a Jew than to be a Christian. Jews were ostracized, but Christians were persecuted. Now, the majority of us in this room are never going to be tortured for our faith. Although there are lots of folks throughout this world who are, uh, but most of us in this room are not going to face that. Yet we do have very challenging times because life can be hard and quite painful. And there are times when we get discouraged. These words to the early Christians are very important for us because we too need to know that we have folks cheering us on. We need to remember that there are people who face challenging times who stood firm in their faith, who knew that God was with them every step of the way. The folks listed in the book of Hebrews were mostly ordinary men and women, but they ended up doing extraordinary things because of their faith in God. They were men like Noah. Remember how God told him that there's going to be a flood and he gave Noah plans to build an ark in the middle of a desert? And he did it? That took some courage. Took great faith building this huge boat over years and years. Then there is Abraham, and God comes to him and says, I want you to go to this land. And Abraham follows him off the map, not knowing where he's going, taking his whole family, moving to a land that God's going to eventually show him. And Abraham made lots of mistakes along the way. But God was with him. The grandstands are also full of folks like Moses, who led an entire nation out of slavery in Egypt. Moses, a goat herder, a person who stuttered. Gideon, who defeated an army of 30,000 Midianites with only 300 men. David, who conquered a Philistine giant with a slingshot. The Bible says that these heroes and others, by their faith, conquered kingdoms, administered justice, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. Confidence in God's power and God's presence often enables us to overcome any obstacle we may face. We need to remember their stories. Think about it this way. Do you think that any of those athletes competing in Rio are aware of previous champions? For example, will gymnasts know that at 14 years of age, Nadia Comaneci in the 1976 Montreal Olympics scored seven perfect tens? You bet they will. Are long jumpers aware that an American Bob Beeman leaped an amazing 29 feet, two and a half inches in Mexico City in 1968, breaking the broad jump record by not just a few inches, but by 22 inches? Yeah, they're going to know about that. A star in track and field would certainly know of Jesse Owens, who won multiple gold medals in Berlin in 36 while breaking down racial barriers. One more Olympian story. I never heard this. I was fascinated. 
1912 in Stockholm, the pentathlon was dominated by the host country, Sweden. The exception was an army, American Army lieutenant who, um, in the shooting event, completely missed the target. At least that's what the judges said. He claimed the bullet went through the hole that he had already shot. If that was true, George Patton would have won the event and gone home with a gold medal. Instead, he went home with fifth place, but he went on to command the Third Army and helped achieve victory for the Allies in Europe. I thought that was interesting. The point is that Olympic hopefuls know about past performances in their event. They hold up these people as champions, and they give them hope, and they give them courage, and they almost feel their presence as they participate. So in our life of faith, as we, as we want to become spiritual champions, or maybe not even champions, but just all-in people of faith, we need to be encouraged. And we can remember those who have gone before us. We can remember the biblical heroes. We can remember modern-day heroes. And we can share our stories with one another. Just two weeks ago, Wayne Hudgens stood in worship and told us how God had been with him when he was homeless and struggling with addictions and got him off the street. Last week, we heard from Deborah Williams how God had been with her in amazingly tangible ways in the midst of a tragedy. These folks are heroes right here in our congregation. When I hear their stories, I am encouraged, and I know that God is right there with me if I just open my eyes to God's presence. Who are your heroes of faith? Of course, mine, Mother Teresa, wow, amazing woman. Martin Luther King Jr., amazing. But also think about my sister. My sister was diagnosed with breast cancer when her son was two years old. And for 10 years, she battled cancer. She had surgery almost every year. She had round after round after round after round with chemotherapy and radiation. Yet she never gave up for 10 years. She never stopped living life to the fullest. She kept on teaching a women's Bible study weekly. She was in worship almost every single week. She served as homeroom chair for her son's classes all the way through. She was on the PTA board. She spoke countless times at the Race for the Cure, talking about what it's like to live with recurring cancer. She was working on a Master of Divinity when she died. She had amazing faith. She knew that each day was a gift, and she didn't say, oh, I have cancer that is all over my body, so I'm just going to go to bed and die. In fact, when they told her she only had six weeks left to live, she said, nope, give me more chemotherapy, and she lived for another five months. She gave her life to serving Christ and didn't feel sorry for herself. Another person I think of is my friend Penny. She was diagnosed with cancer in her 30s and had a radical mastectomy, went through chemo and radiation. About five years later after that, her husband, who was an extremely athletic, physically fit young man, developed multiple sclerosis, ended up in a wheelchair, and soon ended up in a nursing home because he was so, uh, his body had failed so much and he was in serious depression. Then about five years ago, her daughter and her daughter's fiancé were killed in a tragic car accident on Easter Sunday. Penny has had tragedy after tragedy after tragedy in her life, yet she continues to proclaim that God is Lord of all, and that gives her strength to carry on. She is a parish nurse in a church, Presbyterian church in Georgetown, providing care for other people that are going through challenging times. She just recently started a group here in Round Rock called Pas Compassionate Friends for people who have gone through the pain of losing a child. She has taken her grief and turned it into something that ministers to other people she could have just gone to bed she could have said forget you god my precious daughter and her fiance were killed in a car wreck but she has found faith in jesus christ to see her through and so when i'm having a hard time i think about penny and i think <laughs> she can go through that i can go through whatever i'm going through right now so who is your hero? This month we're going to be talking about how we are spiritual champions or how we fully engage in the life of faith. And we're looking at the Olympics and reading from Hebrews 11 and 12 as how we do that. But I want you to think about your heroes of faith because they do encourage you. Think about how their faith empowered them to do great things. 
Maybe read some spiritual autobiographies. Talk to your friends and share faith stories. One more video I want to show you. You know, when you encourage somebody, it helps them when they get to a point of crisis. So I want you to think about how you can encourage somebody in their life of faith today so that when they hit a tough time, they're encouraged. This is a video of some of our athletic contenders who had tough times as children, and now they're remembering that as they're competing in the Olympics and the encouragement they got from family. So let's watch this video. Think about how you... those competitors had somebody who had encouraged them in their life and then when life got stressful they remembered that friends you can encourage your brothers and sisters in the life of faith and then when each one of us hits a hard time we can remember we can remember those things and that can give us the confidence to face anything because we know there is nothing in life or in death that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Gracious and most holy God, we are so grateful that you have had so many people go before us who have lived out their faith with passion and commitment. God, sometimes it is hard for us. Life gets overwhelming and we think we're the only one who has had life this hard. Help us to remember the stories of those who have gone before May their stories give us confidence. And God, may we be people who give confidence to others. May we encourage one another in our life of faith so that we can grow into the people that you have created us to be. God, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.